Titus chapter 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, gray, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil to say of you. And Lord, with that, we are grateful for the fact that we get to open in your word and that these things that have been written, God breathed into, in our case today, the Apostle Paul, that somehow the mystery of taking believers and saints in times of old, that they would hear you and declare forth as imperfect people the perfect word, the sound word. And we don't understand how that works, but we know that the vastness of God is such that he can work through any vessel to communicate and to deliver your truth. So with that said, we pray now that, that you would once again just speak to our hearts, encourage, fill to overflowing, let us, Lord, take those things that we've heard and received and to do them, and to give away those aspects of our life, Lord, which would bring salvation to others. And it's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. So, last week, Titus, chapter 1, Paul is writing a letter very similar to that which he wrote to Timothy's first letter. In fact, he wrote it about the same time, similar time frame. And yet it was to a different direction. Timothy, of course, was, was in Ephesus, and Titus is in, is in Crete. He was left there in Crete, and specifically in verse 5, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I appointed thee. So basically there's this island of Crete and things are crazy in the island of Crete. There's churches there, but there's a lot of false doctrine and there's no leadership that's in place. So Paul tells Titus, here's what I want you to do. I want you to establish elders in those cities. And then when he's talking about establishing elders, the presbyteros, he goes on and he begins to talk about the episcopos, the overseers, or the bishops, or the pastors. At the very least, we want to have elders in those churches, because those churches are wanting of leadership. There's false doctrine that's going on. But then it's interesting, because as he continues to write, he morphs from talking about elders in one verse to talking about overseers and pastors as if to say that you know we can at least have elders but if we can see people men raised up to oversee the flock of God that's what we want that's the ideal so as a result he gives an overview for what the elders should be doing the the characteristics the um, the 
requirements, so to speak. But then he goes in and starts to talk about overseers specifically, and that goes right in line with what uh, Paul was talking to Timothy about, about bishops or overseers, pastors, and then in turn with deacons. So here he talks about first, makes mention of elders, one line, and then he talks about overseers. And this is, becomes important because sometimes there's the idea that, well, you know, how church government should be and so on. What we want ideally are men who are raised up by God, who have a heart for God, and a heart for shepherding his church, and overseeing and caring for and, um, and ministering to the flock there. And so Titus, as Timothy, was in a position here, but he had a whole island, and he, his role then was to oversee what's going on in the whole island, and then as pastors are raised up to oversee those pastors as well. All of, all of it being at the extension of God's hand here. So why was this so important? Well, I mentioned it earlier, but it's specifically said in verse 10 of the previous chapter, where false and corrupt teachers, particularly of the circumcision, were going about that island. They were, they were teachers who were bringing in the Mosaic law and making that a requirement for the Gentiles who were being saved. Now, whether it was Jew or Gentile, that Mosaic law was not needful to be a requirement either way. That we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any of us should boast. That the idea of the law being fulfilled completely in Jesus Christ is what Paul was emphasizing. And yet you had Judaizers, people who, which we could sort of liken now, not completely, but you could liken it to the Messianic movement today, where people are coming on the scene and they're saying, well, you know, it's, it's great that you're saved and all, but you would be super saved if you were circumcised, if you weren't already circumcised. And you would be super saved if you kept the Sabbath. And you would be super saved if you went on and, and even on the website last message, I, I have a, a reference to the 613 laws, commands that are given through the word of God. And boy, if you did those things, then God would be that much more happy with you. And the fact is, is God can't be any more happy with us. He saved us while we were yet sinners, and he took us by his grace. He gave us the gift of eternal life. Not that we were deserving, but he just said, I want to give them a gift. And one analogy I've used in the past is kind of like receiving a gift of a, of a smartphone, a cell phone, or something along that line. You get it, and it, it could just be something in a box, but then you begin to unwrap it, and there's, there's apps, there's applications, there's things that it broadens, and it goes deep, and you find, wow, this, this is awesome. It applies. It, it not only can wake me up in the morning and be something that you know I can receive calls from, but it can be used in a number of different ways. And all the more, God's grace, which he pours out upon us, we're saved by it. It's all his doing. And so adding to those laws, adding to those requirements only show a lack of faith in God's grace. And there's a departure from what God's done, and it turns into something of works. And that's what Paul was concerned about, having to do with not only Titus on the island of Crete, but also throughout all the Gentile places where Paul had been. And sadly, it was even taking place there in Jerusalem. Of course, we would expect it to take place there in Jerusalem, but it was taking place there. Paul's jurisdiction, his oversight was toward the Gentile churches. That's what God called him to, or that's who God called him to. So he had this concern. And then lastly, um, after he gives these sort of requirements or um expectations for what an elder and what a bishop should be. And again, it's not that those things, you know, sometimes people, they make mistakes or, you know, talked about a husband of one wife, and it's just like, well, I was previously married or had, you know, those types of things. It's not that, that those matters are not forgivable, 
But from the standpoint of leadership within the church, we need to be above reproof. We need to be credible. So I think another example that I used was not a striker. So if you've got a tendency to be a hothead and to hit people, well, that's going to diminish and undermine the work of the ministry for you. <laughs> it's just, you know, you might win a lot of people to the Lord, but as far as leading the church, it's going to be a problem. So we have those examples that are given with respect to the uh, presbyteros, the elders, and the episcopos, the bishops or the overseers, or the, uh, the pastors themselves. Now, in chapter 2, he goes into just the body of Christ. He begins to tell Titus, he says, this, these attributes encourage the body of Christ. And he, he actually breaks it down for the aged or the older men, and then the older women, and then the younger women, and the younger men, and then he talks to servants and so on before he wraps it up. So, in very, you know, in verse one, it starts, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And I like this because it says, which become. The word there in Greek means it's prepo, which means to prepare. And it has the connotation of building up a tower. It's you're building up something. You're, you're building up something that's tangible. And so what he's telling Titus is, I want you to speak those things which build up sound doctrine. That as we, you and I, as we speak those things which are true from the word, then what that does is that builds something that it seems it's as real and it's as tangible as a tower or a building in our heart. It's something that we live by. It's something that we recognize, that we see, we look at, and so on. It's much like you know faith being the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance, it's evidential, but it's the word of God. Yet we're building up, we're preparing something, we're building this in doctrine. And that's what he's telling Titus to do in verse 1. He says specifically, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Speak those things of truth. So as a new believer, we may have one scripture verse, John 3.16 or, uh, you know, for God so loved the world, or, or uh, just whatever, whatever the verse is. And yet, as we hear that truth, the truth of God's word, not what God or what the world says is truth, because you can't be certain with that sort of truth, but God's truth, God's word, rightly divided. Again, that's another thing that's important. A lot of people say, oh, lots of different interpretations. No, rightly dividing, rightly cutting the word of truth. That as we hear those scripture verses and rightly divide the truth, we have an understanding of it, then little by little we add, we, we build this thing called sound doctrine. And it becomes something that we can hold on to, that we can run into. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they're safe. That the strong tower, the name of the Lord and who he is becomes a place of doctrine that we can run into that and be safe. We're safe in the doctrine, in the truth of God's word. We're safe in that. And again, to I cannot overemphasize this, but it's the idea that doctrine and truth of God's word, interpretation of God's word, that it's singular. That there are not multiple interpretations we need to search what the right division is of god's word as i mentioned before you know measure twice cut once if we're going to cut a piece of wood and a lot of people are lousy craftsmen they they try to do it with you know and doesn't matter what the tool is the right tool makes it easier to make a good cut but it's imperative that you make a good cut and that you don't make a bad cut with respect to doctrine and then try to weasel out of why it looks so bad or why it's so incredible, unbelievable. So with that said, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Then he says to the older men or the aged men, he says that they may be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. One verse 
probably one verse because old guys can't remember much more than one verse. At least that's my take on that one. Why it's just one verse and why it's not a bunch of verses. Because simply put, that aged men, first of all, be sober. Now, the literal meaning of that is circumspect, but it's the idea that if you're not sober, then you don't really know what's going on around you. It's questionable that you even know what's going on in front of you. That's why you pull people over. Because when they're driving within sobriety, they're sort of all over the road. They can't even discern where the lines are and what's in front of them, much less what's behind them. And so the first admonition for aged men, and where would we want to put that? What number is that? Hmm. What number is that? Let's see. How old am I? Hmm. Okay. Let's say aged men is 57 and up, or 60 and up. That Because I want to qualify as the younger men category. Anyway, regardless of where you may categorize yourself, I believe that the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and tell you where you are in this. And he'll convict us of these things. So, must be sober and then grave. And the literal meaning there is respectful or honest. That they just be, you ever, you know, there's something that happens to old guys sometimes. Sometimes there's a dishonesty. There's this, um, you've heard that phrase, dirty old man. And there's this, it's like, that's what the world is about. And instead, though, when we do come across those men that are older, that are sober-minded, they're, they're aware of perspective. They see what's going on in the world. They've, this is not their first time through it all, that when they see the events that are taking place in the world, they have perspective into this. They know what's going on. And as a result of that, of that sobriety and then that honesty or reverence or respectfulness, that they can give forth good counsel and good wisdom, true wisdom, that's related to God's word. And we're encouraged by it. And so in addition to that, that they're temperate. And temperance literally means to be safe and sound in mind. Now, I reference that because we see this coming up in the very next verse, because the next one is sound in faith. So it's almost like temperance. I wish they had, they had actually written this down as the literal meaning was, because it would, it would just flow wonderfully. Safe and sound in mind and sound in faith. Sound faith, sound mind. And that the two really should go hand in hand. And then to be in charity. Agape love, where they are others-oriented, they're others-centered. I talked about this, I think, last week, but I kind of came down a little bit on the, on the guys here last week or the week before. But, you know, as guys, we can kind of think, you know, especially if we're the quote-unquote breadwinners in our house, that now we become the king of the castle, where we need to remember that we are supposed to be servants of all. And that we don't attain to this place and then start to make demands because this is, you know, what we've earned and who we are and, and what's expected. You know, everybody needs to serve us. In fact, as we get older, we're supposed to have this charity, but that should be it, at work in us on the front end, too, early in our lives, where it's the idea that, you know, I'm last in my household. And the things that, I mean, you can test this a number of ways. For me personally, I, I can test it. Okay, so who's driving the best car in the house? Who's got the nicest phone in the house? You know, all these things you can begin to justify. And then who's got the nicest stuff in the house? The nicest clothes, the nicest and you can kind of begin to look at that. And I know for me, I look at that and I think, okay, I'm kind of been, I've been self-serving in this area. Who's got the nicest chair? Who's got the recliner? Everyone else is on the couch, right? We understand. And so it's a mindset. It's an attitude that we can have as dads, as older people, where we sort of demand this respect instead of being people who are all about charity. And in, in turn, patience. Charity 
and patience. So there's this others giving love that you give out, and there's a patience that accompanies it. I just had grandkids at my house yesterday. Patience. <laughs> Charity. I love my grandkids, but grandkids do grandkid things. I think that they do grander things that you that you didn't really plan on. They get, make grander messes. They make grander things like that. But you love them, and you're, you're patient with them. And, and anyway, so older men, sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. And then the aged women, older women, likewise, and then it goes on, that they may be, or that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. In other words, that their behavior is holy behavior. Now, as an aged woman, not speaking for one, but in that position, you have decades of potentially monotonously serving your husband that demands the recliner and your kids that are demanding everything. And so it's easy, I think that the reason why this is here is to emphasize aged women older women to have behavior which is holy and to stay on track with that to not lose sight of that because it's easy to just say oh I've given up my life I could have had a career I could have had these things but I stayed home and there's there could be like a bitterness that can come with that things didn't work out the way that you wanted them to work out your kids aren't as perfect as you thought they'd be you discovered pretty quickly that your husband isn't, isn't as perfect as you wanted him to be. And you might even be picking at him and them in order to bring about that perfection instead of praying for them to just pick at them. But no, instead to have holy behavior, behavior which is gracious. I mean, if we begin to think about what holiness and what is Christ likeness, it, it means gracious and merciful and, and at peace, not unholy, not false accusers, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now, it's interesting that all of these, except for the young women, well, no, it, it applies to the young women too, that with the older men, older women, younger men, younger women, they're all told to be sober. They're all told to be sober, to not be given to wine, <clears throat> to have perspective, to not lose sight. I think that what happens in our lives as younger men and women is that we start on this road of, yeah, it's just a recreational thing. It kind of, you know, loosens us up and we introduce a little bit of this wine into our lives. And then as things get tense, difficult, things aren't working out like we wanted them to, that there's an increase in that alcohol, that wine, whatever the substance is, because times get difficult and you, you're you just, it's difficult. We're just having a conversation about the, what percentage, I think Greg mentioned, percentage of people on antidepressants, 80%. So if that's a legitimate number, 80%. So, you know, things, are, times are trying in these last days and things are difficult in these last days and they are not working out like we wanted them to work out our lives we started but then it's just like things have changed God had other plans and so as a result of that in order to sort of navigate it then we see the, the drinking enter in don't do that Teachers of good things, people of holiness to the aged women, older women, not false accusers, not given too much wine. Young women, that they, the aged women, may teach the young women to be what? Sober, same thing. So older men, be sober. Aged women, not given too much wine. Young women, to be sober. To love their husbands and to love their children. And I think that that 
younger women area where it says to love your husband, to love your children, that's taking place maybe 10 years into the marriage and 10 years into having kids. Because in the very beginning, you love your husband. And in the very beginning, that baby comes forth and you love that baby. But then things happen. And they both do things. And it's easy to fall out of love if that love is not agape love, if it's not others-oriented, unconditional love. If it's all conditional based upon you've got to serve me, you've got to have your life together, you've got to be perfect. And, you know, when we got married, you told me what your dreams were, and that included wealth and prosperity, and, and it's not working out that way. And we have our kids that we had such hope, we see the potential in them, and then they take a turn, which brings that to question. And it might even bring it to question to the degree that we're wondering that it's even going to work out for them. And we're embarrassed by their behavior. No. Older women teach the younger women to love their husbands. To love their children. To be discreet, verse 5. Same word as temperate in verse 2. To be of sound and safe mind, to be discreet, and then chaste, which specifically chaste means clean, properly clean, innocent, modest. So older women teaching the younger women to be chaste, to be proper, to be clean, to have a cleanliness with your life. And it says here, keepers of at home. So I believe that the, the intent here is still the idea of a family. And we could say, well, culturally things have changed. But I, I believe that the Lord is really concerned about the family and the position of the family and the training up of these kids. And some, sadly, some people may go professional. I know lots of men that are very professional so that they don't have to, professional meaning like out in the workplace and doing all that, just so that they don't have to be around those kids <laughs> and sadly I think moms are doing that too so as a result there's the need to you know turn that around and say okay this this is what's needful right now I need to train up my kids uh, dads you're the pastor of your house are you qualifying under those pastoral overseer uh, qualifications in the previous chapter Are you pastoring? Are you looking for, you know, how you can care for and and are you subjecting yourself to those rules and saying, you know, these are things that are that are important for overseers, but you know, wouldn't our kids want the same things out of us as dads? And same thing having to do with the moms. They're the ones who have that delegated role of training up our kids in the way they should go. And yes, that's the dads too. I don't want to neglect the dads in this. It's under their headship and authority, but but the day in, the, the day out, if there's homeschooling especially, that's that's something that the mom is doing. And, and there can be a lot of resentment there if, if she, you know, could have had a career in something that was making a lot of money and not having to deal with a lot of things. And so as a result, it's like, okay. So older women, aged women are supposed to teach the young women about these things, to be keepers at home, to be good. So my mom, when I leave and go places, she'll say things like, behave yourself, be good. <laughs> and it's one of those things where it's like, well, of course I'm going to be good. I'm going to behave myself. But it's just something that she says that's part of her vocabulary. It's part of what she wants. She desires that goodness prevail and continue. And so as a result, she'll say, okay, well, be good. And we could find ourselves saying the same things other people as well but here we see it specifically older women you're supposed to teach younger women be good be a good wife be a good person be a be just a just good let the holy spirit reveal to you what that means search it out study the word what is it to be good i'm reminded of when 
that question came up. This will this will come up in our house. Like sometimes it's like, hey, Zach, do you want uh, or some you know the, the guys? I'll say, would you guys like a you know seconds of of lasagna or something? No, I'm good. Then I'll respond, whoa, there's nothing good but God, because that's what Jesus said. And it's like, okay, well, we need, does that mean we're in line with the Lord? And I think that that's what that's talking about here. Okay, moving on. Obedient to their own husbands. Doesn't mean obedient to every man, but it does mean obedient to their own husbands. And so that puts us into the position, the example goes all the way back to Sarah and Abraham. Oh, Lord, help this husband to have good decisions, because I need to be obedient to him as the head of that household, of my household. And so you're praying. You're praying for this crazy person that you've married and that you're locked in to be obedient to. And now you're, you're saying, oh, God, help me. And thankfully, God does work supernaturally through that man just because of his role as a husband and just because of that role as a dad. He works through him. So if it's not, though, Either way, you still want to pray for them. So, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So, what's worse than to see a woman who says, yes, I'm, I'm in Christ and I love the Lord, but then is all out of whack on these things. And it's just like, I'm not going to follow Jesus if that's what it means. If that's what following Jesus is, that's not what I'm going to do. It's not it for me. It's not going to happen. And so, again, moving on from there, we get this idea given to us for older men, older women, uh, younger women, and then we come to the young men. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded, so sober and circumspect. Again, the whole idea of sobriety. You kind of wonder, what's going on on that island of Crete? You know, what's going on there? They're just like... They're, it's like cabin fever, man. It's it's the island disease. They're on this thing, and they're all going nuts. And so now they're just drinking in order to get, get through it, perhaps. And I would say that that can happen to us. We can get isolated in the things, even as being Christians. We can sit, get sort of isolated instead of in fellowship. And so we, what we find is this, hey, man, I just need to get through this. Or I just want to party or relax a little bit or whatever. And it takes us down a bad road. So... Again, sober-mindedness. I exhort to be sober-minded, sober, circumspect, perspective, have an understanding of what's going on around you. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Showing yourself a pattern. So it applies to young men, but then here Paul includes Titus in this, which kind of tells us that Timothy was a very young man, but Titus was a young man also. And he includes him. So he says, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. So I'm talking about young men, but I'm talking about you, Titus. I'm, I'm including you in this. And this is what you need to be. This is what all young men need to be. They need to have a pattern of sound or a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness or purity and gravity and sincerity. So gravity, uh, the other other meaning for that is honesty, but I like how it is in the King James, because uh, nothing tests uh, if something is true. I mean, gravity does it, right? So if uh, you, know, you want to test if gravity works, jump out of your window, and then you find out the, the truth of that. It happens there. And that there be this gravity going on in the mind of young men that we know that we need to represent those things are true because there's a consequence at the bottom of it if it isn't true. So, as a result, sound speech that cannot be condemned, verse 8, in that he is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say to you. So, young men, not just purity or, or gravity, honesty or genuineness and sincerity, but to have sound speech, sound speech, those things which are above reproof, can't be condemned. And then notice, 
that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say. So it means that the speech is consistent with the actions and that there's no reproof that's associated with it. And specifically in Colossians 1.21, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So if our goal is to be above reproach in the sight of God, then we'll be above reproach in the sight of men. But that that's the goal. That's what we're supposed to be about as young men. Well, I think I'm going to go back to the old man category because that's easier. Maybe. I don't think so. I think that there's certain pressures that happen with respect, with respect to the aged because the enemy... We know we're running out of time to get the gospel out and to win converts, but the enemy is running out of time to kill us and to get us to deny our faith. So the pressure's on for those who are older. It's not an easier spot. Some just bury their head in the sand, wait for death, but that pressure is on for the older. Exhort servants, so it sort of transitions now into servants, and this could be, you know, there's slavery then, as there's slavery now, you could be enslaved where you work, there is slavery that's going on throughout the world right now. Um, you know, the slavery that we talk about in the Bible is, is that which you're perhaps indebted, you find yourself in a situation, I think the example I used last Wednesday was one where Let's say perhaps there was an illness that took place, and as a result, you've got medical bills to pay to the doctor, and you know he's not just going to take a chicken or, or some eggs for it. And so you become, by agreement or by contract, you become their slave for a period of time. Old Testament, book of Exodus. But see, that's contractual. The slavery that usually happens is kidnapping, sales, and trafficking in that manner. But it still exists. Now, we can be in slavery to the people that we work for because let's say that we have bought a car that we shouldn't have bought or a house that was too expensive. So the borrower is slave to the lender and so we're in a contract, but we've got to work that bad boy out. We're in it. And so we're literally enslaved to this employer or that employer or, you know, in some manner because of our indebtedness. So when he's talking to servants, I believe he's talking to actual servants, slaves, but it applies to all of us who are slave to a lender or that are in a position where we have a boss, a manager, someone who's overseeing us. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. In other words, not talking back. Now, clearly, if you talked back, in, you know, in this culture now, I hear people talking back at their bosses and they're not fired for it. They could be in a, the boss could be in a position where they're like a middle manager, so they they just get the role of having to manage them, but they don't get any ability to, um, to leverage that position and say, you're a bad apple, you're out of here. So that middle manager just gets stuck with dealing with people that are mean to them and not doing their job. And they're saying they're not doing their job and they're responsible for not doing the job, but they won't get them fired because there's too many lawsuits, too much litigation involved with getting them fired. So they're stuck. If you're a business owner, you see someone that's bad, you just say, you're fired. Wasn't there a show about that some time ago? <laughs> we got fired too. It's not over. <laughs> so, with that said, we see something that's taking place here with servants that even under your breath, you don't have this attitude. You please them well in all things. You're obedient to your own master. You're, you, you know, you're not sucking up to them, but, and I don't even know about that phrase, so maybe that's a bad phrase. The point is, is that you're not doing things that are 
wrong, but that you're just being a good employee. Just be a good worker, a good employee. If you start at a certain time, be ready to start. Don't show up then or within your seven minute time frame that you can still be late and it still counts for that to be on time and then go and go to the bathroom and get a cup of coffee and eat breakfast and all of that stuff. Get there and be the best employee that's there. And you might not get employee of the month, doesn't matter. Do it anyway. You might not get employee of the month just because you're a peculiar person being a Christian, and we'll get to that verse here shortly. Just because of it, it being a bias against you, but you still do it. You're still the best worker that's there. You please them in all things. You don't talk back. You don't answer again. You're not uh, embezzling, which is purloining here. You're not holding back something, pilfering from your boss, but showing all good fidelity, faithfulness, conviction. You're true. You're a true person. Anyone that's in the, you know, the Marines, hey, Semper Fi, right? Talks about faithfulness. That's what that Fi part is. Faithful. And it's, it's almost like a, having this brotherhood of faithfulness, showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. I like that. In other words, it means to adorn the doctrine. So we were talking about building up the doctrine, right? Like a, like a tower. Well, think of it instead of like a wardrobe. You're, you're building this wardrobe of sound doctrine, and you're putting this on. That you're, you're putting that on you now. Kind of reminds us of the armor of God, doesn't it? So you're adorning yourself in this sound doctrine, in this the understanding of what these what these precepts are, what this teaching is. You're putting it all in order. So you're not stealing. Two verses, pretty straightforward. And then he goes on, and these are the verses we're closing with, of course. But <clears throat> then he says. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. God's grace has appeared to all men. Everybody has been given the gift of grace. It's been made available to all men. All men of all types of men. And I think this belief or relates to men and women in the broader sense. Not like our Congress or House of Representatives would have us believe but that it's broadly speaking to all men that it's you know Jew and Gentile slave and free men and women that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. So Paul brought this up. He said, yeah, well, with the grace of God, don't be this type that just continues in sin and just says, well, you know, I'm covered under God's grace, of course. This verse is telling us that we continue to walk righteously. We've been saved by grace, but it's still a righteous walk. I, I think of life sometimes. I thought of this this week specifically, that, that life is a little bit like getting onto a tightrope. With respect to God, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That we have a tightrope of righteousness that we need to be on. And some people are trying to do it, walk that line by their own strength and their own ability, and they have no net. And some are able to do it for a time. I remember in, <clears throat> so let's see, so I was around 13 or 14 years old. There was this tightrope walker, and he was part of a family of tightrope walkers, the Flying Walendas. Does anyone know who I'm talking about? Flying Walendas. And Carl Walenda, the patriarch of the house, 73 years old. He's in Puerto Rico, 1978. He's crossing two buildings, about 150 feet. 
And this is nothing for him. He's done this. He's crossed longer distances. But this particular day, he was on the cable, and it wasn't secured that well. And it was a windy day. And at 73 years old, after having tightrope walks, probably maybe even hundreds of miles, he fell and he died. And it was devastating. I mean, it was in the news. People knew who the, the flying Walendas were. And he died. Now, the idea here for the illustration is that God gives us a net. That's the grace of God. And so we're up on this, and we're told that we need to walk this righteous line. And the fact is, is everybody is going to fall. Everyone's going to fall, and they're going to fall to their death. But the grace there is that if we trust him by his grace, we walk that line with a net and we continue to fall and he continues to put us on but we've still got the narrow line to walk we still have this righteousness to walk in and thankfully right now being a born-again believer you still have a sin nature but you have the holy spirit as well and that there, there are I referenced it earlier, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That we can get on to that, and that we can walk that, and in the Spirit, we can walk that and not fall off. But we still have sin nature. And if, for some reason, that thing is not secured, or the wind is blowing and we fall off, we still live. Whereas the rest of the world, they don't. They don't live through it. And I illustrate that because a lot of people just think, hey, I'm saved under God's grace, so now I'm, you know, party down, and why go to church? Why have, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ? Why be involved in righteousness? Why, I mean, I was just watching a show yesterday about the emergent church, and <clears throat> and the, uh, not just the emergent church, but the, the, um, the seeker sensitive church because they're both kind of tied into one another the willow creek model all the way over to willow creek is in chicago all the way to uh rob bell and mclaren and and um you know purpose driven <coughs> that all of these just turn away from god's word and righteousness and turn it into just an act of trying to do it yourself. And some of them just totally deny God's word altogether. And so as a result here, we see the grace of God that brings salvation, saves us. It's appeared to all men. And that appearance, of course, is through Jesus Christ, has appeared through the towers, through the adornment of sound doctrine. It appears to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then it goes on in verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That there's this idea, this is what is sad with the church today, is that they've, they've become post-trib, all-millennial, preterist, meaning it was all fulfilled. Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD, and that John wrote it, 20 years later and just said, well, it was all fulfilled. Crazy theology there. But they're not looking for the blessed hope of Jesus Christ. And so as a result, what does it say further? It says that who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. You are peculiar. You're looking for Jesus Christ. That makes you peculiar. You don't have to dress peculiarly. You can be normal, and you're still going to be classified as peculiar. I heard a story of 
one pastor who, when he was going through Bible college, he, he saw this one woman that was always dressing like a goon. He said, why do you dress like that? Well, the Bible says we're peculiar people. <laughs> His point was, that's not what he was talking about. <laughs> that's not what he was talking about. Just the fact that we're looking for a rapture of being caught up to him and that we're busy, that that defines how we conduct our lives. We know that it can happen at any time. If the Lord comes to tomorrow, then we, our time is short to win people to Christ. If he comes within the decade, then we have a whole decade to introduce people to Jesus Christ. Who do you know in your family that does not know Jesus? You have that, whatever amount of time it is, to introduce them to Jesus Christ. You're peculiar. But you're in Christ. And it purifies us unto himself. It purifies how we walk. Because we know that God can come at any time. And we're not afraid, but that we're busy about the work. So our credibility, the way we walk, we're sober-minded. It makes us credible. And it purifies us. And we're looking for Jesus to come at any time. And we're sharing that with other people. It makes us peculiar. That's okay. Because it's peculiar around the truth of God's return. Speak these things and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So remember he said to Timothy, don't let anyone despise you because of your youth. Well, here he's talking to Titus and he's saying the same thing. Don't let anyone despise you. This is what you need to do. Speak. Exhort. And rebuke with all authority. Speak, exhort, rebuke with all authority. And I would add to that, not to add to scripture, but it's the idea here that don't do things that are going to undermine or cause people to despise your ministry because you're out of line with these things. But that you're in line with them, so no one's going to despise you. Your kids honor you and they respect you because you speak with authority and you don't undermine it with crummy behavior. You speak with authority at work, but it's reinforced by the manner in which you conduct yourself. That it's not undermined because you're taking extra long breaks and whatever. That there's a consistency in our lives which is really just called godliness. It's just that. That we're saved by his grace and he's keeping us on this path of righteousness and we see the people around us that are not saved and we love them and we want to see them born again. We want to see them with the net because we know they're going to fall even if they are on the right track. We know they're going to fall because all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. They're all going to fail and they need that. I believe the first one is a given because it says the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I think that in some respects he sort of lays that out there. But dummies as we are, we say, nope, I need no net. I'm going to take it without the net. I don't need a crutch. I can walk this line. I believe in myself. And then they fall. And that net isn't there. Now, don't get me wrong to think that it's a universalism there, that all are saved, okay? Don't take that the wrong way. But I think that there's plenty of opportunities where the Lord has shown us that he can save all men. And we say, no, I don't need that. And they reject it. That, sadly, is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I don't need God. I don't need the net. I don't need salvation by him. I can do it myself. Well, God forbid, Lord, that we would adopt that as believers, that we would have anything, any trial, any difficulty, anything going on in our environment, surroundings, in our world, that would cause us to make that departure from you, to say we have no need of you. Help us, Lord, to be sober-minded, to have that perspective, to walk righteously, to have that consistency of fellowship with you and to always remember that 
we are saved by your grace, not of works, lest any other should boast. But help us, Lord, to have a credible ministry. Help us, Lord, to walk in a manner that when people see that, they might look at us at first, but then we could just, in turn, glorify you. We thank you that in the midst, in light of our imperfections, that you've saved us, that you've given us this gift of grace. We pray, God, that we would walk in the fullness of it, though. Help us to do these things, to speak, to exhort, and to rebuke with all authority as you lead us. Bless everybody that is here today, everybody that is watching online. We pray, God, for the outpouring of your spirit to fulfill those things that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.